the Watergate episode is one of the strangest parts of U.S. history because it is so bizarre in in what was going on behind the scenes to the point that it's hard to say. I cannot say definitively what really happened uh, during Watergate and what made it unfold the way that it did. The burglars who broke into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee at the Watergate were in effect breaking into the home of every citizen of the United States. The criminality of the Nixon administration was significant, and he did take a different role in centralizing some of the, the criminal chicanery of the federal government in the White House, which on the surface seems like it would be a bit scary that we are doing these things that we associate with totalitarian or authoritarian or fascist regimes, black bag operations and subversion of civil society and so on, undermining of democratic uh, opponents. But the fact of the matter is the historian Eric Foner pointed this out, and he's not any kind of Nixon fan, but he has this high school history textbook, and I was teaching high school history while I was working on my dissertation. And in one section he's, uh, of the book talking about Watergate, he lists Nixon's crimes, and he said Nixon's defense was that many of these things had been going on in the national security state for a long time, and he, he wasn't, you know, other people had committed crimes too. Uh, this I'm summarizing. And then Foner says essentially, well, Nixon had a point. <laughs> so he, he really did. And the people that were uh, anti-Nixon, people like James McCord or people like Richard Helms, people that did not cooperate with him, um, people like Al Haig, you know, his, his own chief of staff who really undermined him. These were not people who were pro-democracy, pro-lawfulness. Like these were people who were often to hit Nixon's right politically. And that, I think, is the big thing to think about with Watergate, is what did it really accomplish in the end? I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. There was a myth of Watergate as this time where the free press stood up to a corrupt leader and the journalists did a great job exposing the corruption and then the president had to leave office in disgrace and democracy was restored. But the overall effects of Watergate did not do anything about the criminality of the clandestine state. So all the intelligence agencies before very long were back up and running maybe even worse than before. Uh, and economically, uh, or just across the board, politically, the U.S. moved to the right after getting rid of Nixon. And I think that a part of this has to do with a certain type of ideology or mission in the upper echelons of the U.S. establishment, that they were going to really go for um, a new kind of dominance in the world. The, the neoconservatives essentially were the victors of this, the, the, the right wing of the U.S. political establishment, and one that was focused on U.S. dominance overall. So they actually thought Kissinger, because he cared about balance of power, that his approach was too was not strong enough for the enemies that, that, the, that the U.S. was facing. And so these neoconservatives, they actually engineered a big shakeup in the Ford administration uh, in which they uh, fired William Colby and replaced him with Bush. They got uh, eventually N Nelson Rockefeller, the quote unquote liberal Republican, steps down. Uh, he's not going to be the running mate in 76. The uh, Kissinger steps down from national security advisor. Uh, the defense secretary uh, is changed. The chief of staff is changed. And the people that organized this were Cheney and Rumsfeld. So I think, that, and, and what the outcome of it was, was that both parties, when the dust settles here, are far to the right of where they were before Watergate began. The, the Republicans end up being the party of Reagan and, you know, sort of a Barry Goldwater, but even further to the right of Barry Goldwater, dominated by neoconservatives. Uh, in foreign policy, super defense spending to try to break the Soviet Union, other uh, plans to destroy the Soviet Union and get it to collapse uh, were put in place under Bush. Um, and we have not really gone back from, from that. And the, the Democrats became the party of what used to be the um, you know party of Eisenhower, uh, Nixon, party of of Cosmo, of, of Capital, the party of, of capital that is tr supranational, more or less. But they're also all, pretty much in agreement with the militarism of the neoconservatives, too. So there's kind of a merging of neoliberalism and neoconservatism uh, with the, the neoliberal economic 
side taking a little bit more uh, of the power under Democrats and then the more militarist side traditionally or often taking precedence in the Republican administrations. But they're all parts of the same coin is this international dollar denominated system that gives the U.S. the ability to have huge military budgets. And it's it's the only way you can maintain this kind of a system is to make sure you basically rule the world. Uh, and the only way to keep ruling the world is to make sure that you maintain this system the whole time. Uh, it's it's been the objective of the U.S. and it's it's uh, actually insane. Uh, and it's you know a global empire. It's taking over the whole world. Basically, that has been their goal. They pretty much stated this. People like Wolfowitz and people in the Project for New American Century. They announced what their goal was, and they pretty much tried to do the steps along the way to get there. And they failed. They failed with NATO expansion in Ukraine. They failed with the global war on terror. They failed with the Arab Spring wars. So Watergate, I think, marks a shift. Uh, a kind of a palace coup of sorts, but it's like an establishment coup. It's like a coup on Mount Olympus. And Nixon, who was sort of a nationalist and really wanted America to prosper and wanted American manufacturing to be strong and had support from labor unions, his kind of politics, which were more nationalist in being pro-America kind of a way, like pro-American people, not just pro-American oligarchy, pro-corporate America. Like he actually had some interest in helping the manufacturing parts of the United States. This was not what was to be. It was, it did not go along with what we could call the globalists or neoliberals, you know, people like uh, Rockefeller and so on, people that really want capital to be free around the world. And then neoconservatives who are not often, you know, the same people, but there's slight difference in emphasis who are really focused on military dominance. Those two groups were the only groups. There was no viable nationalist pro-middle class uh, political formation in the U.S. with any power uh, shortly after Nixon was removed. And I think it's a consequence of these conflicts in the U.S. and Watergate was a part of that. The Kennedy assassination was an earlier conflict over what kind of policy would be acceptable to the oligarchy that essentially controls the U.S. And we saw how that conflict played out. Uh, Nixon had a better, got a better deal than JFK did for sure. The gold standard was informally abandoned in 1968 because LBJ closed the gold window due to the Vietnam, you know, the dollar crisis, uh, the dollar overhang uh, as a result of Vietnam. Too many dollars in foreign central banks and the banks wanted gold as the Bretton Woods Agreement at the end of World War II had uh, stipulated that they would be able to redeem their extra dollars for gold. And this was a system that was put in place because it was kind of unfair that the international currency would be the dollar, which only the U.S. can create. And so the idea was, well, we will tether it to gold so that if we're spending too much money buying up all your stuff or, or whatever, then you can get gold. So we're not going to be able to abuse this privilege. Well, the U.S. did abuse the privilege by fighting wars that were ridiculously expensive that it really couldn't afford based on the monetary arrangement that it had created itself. Uh, and so in 1968, these countries had dollars. Places like Greece and France, uh, they had a, a, a big accumulation of dollars, and the U.S. said, oh, "We're not gonna, we're gonna not really let you trade those in for a while. You got to hold on to those for for a bit." And then 1971, Nixon formally does close the gold window. Now this is a, leads to a period of instability, and other countries were not happy about this. But the Nixon Treasury Secretary, John Connolly, the same guy who was sitting right in front of Kennedy when he got shot in Dallas, still had shrapnel in him for the rest of his life after that. He said to the world about the dollar, he said, it's our currency, uh, it's your problem. <laughs> uh, so he was basically saying to the rest of the world, you've got to deal with it. But there were negotiations about how they could potentially come up with a new, more fair system. Uh, with other powerful countries, uh, you know, the Japanese, Western Europeans, and so on, in negotiations with the U.S. And this was more or less a stalling tactic of the U.S. They really weren't interested in negotiating anything like this. What was happening was they were more or less conspiring to rig oil prices. They'd been going back and forth with people in Saudi Arabia and Iran, especially, um, in order to uh, get them to uh, have raise the price of oil. And they'd, been, they'd spoken about this at a Bilderberg meeting uh, in, in very shortly after the closing of the gold window. And this was something that was planned. And the it seems that the 1973 war was more or less a pretext uh, for this. And, you know, I 
can't get into so much about the details about how the whole thing started. But if you just stop and think about it, that's sort of the proximate cause of a big part of the oil shocks. Um, there were also grain embargoes and other angles that played out. But the bigger point was it seems to you can find examples of them articulating the need to raise the price of oil. And we even have a great quote from the former Saudi uh, oil minister saying that um, he went to Iran to talk about this. And that, as I recall, it was the Shah who told him, why are you complaining about this? This is what they want. Uh, go ask Henry Kissinger. He's the one who asked for this increase. Uh, so you don't you're, you're because the Saudis were afraid of ups, potentially potentially upsetting the United States uh, by raising oil prices uh, in, unilaterally because it, oh, it could potentially harm the U.S. economy. Well, the outcome of that oil crisis was not bad. I mean, typically you'd say, oh, it was bad for Nixon and then the volatility was bad for Ford and Carter. But in reality, the oil crises were very good for the oil majors. And because they got they did make a lot of money selling oil, but also for those countries in the Middle East, the big oil producers, you know, especially in the Middle East and in Indonesia, they accumulated enormous amounts of dollars, basically equivalent to the dollar amount that had been um, expended over Vietnam. And that was kind of the dollar overhang. So they basically spent all that money on Vietnam that was supposed to be redeemed for gold. They closed the gold window. They get their allies to boost the price of oil and to agree to always sell their oil in dollars. And the result is that that money goes into these oil producing countries and that solves the problem of Vietnam. It basically is like, well, this is, this has gone a long way towards solving the, the, the irresponsible policies of Vietnam spending. Now they then take that money, these oil producing countries uh, and they buy treasury bills with it. So that funds the U S debt, but they also put the money into Western financial institutions. Uh, and that those Western financial institutions then make a lot of loans to the third world, the developing world, uh, saying that, the, you know, here, go work on these projects that will help you. OK, a lot of these aren't very good projects. They end up buying uh, American infrastructure companies uh, or hiring them to produce things that are not lucrative. It puts them into debt. But you also they, this money, these this, these petrodollars get recycled into U.S. Fin high finance institutions, loaned out to the third world. And then eventually the U.S. through the Federal Reserve and Paul Volcker, they raise the Federal Reserve major interest rates. And this has sort of a cascade effect on the payments that these third world countries had to make on the, the big loans that they'd taken out, the loans of all those petrodollars. And so it really wrecks their economies because they they get into balance of payments crisis uh, and then they have to let the IMF come in and the IMF comes in and says, well, you got to tighten your belt. You got to sell off all these assets that the state owns. You need to privatize your economy, cut your pensions and everything else. And that makes those countries very, very uh, easy prey for corporate transnational corporations, which in which we're able to sort of pick over the bones of the third world. And this whole thing gets consolidated more or less by the time of Reagan. So you have the gold, closing of the gold standard, Watergate, uh, you know, the, the post-Watergate investigations, the oil shocks, the Volcker shocks, the third world debt crisis, the stagflation in the U.S., uh, the, the economic problem that the U.S. faced. And but by the time the dust settles in the, you know, early on in Reagan's administration, you have this new regime established, uh, a new dollar regime wherein the U.S. can print as many dollars as it wants because the rest of the world accepts them. And the role that used to be played by gold, countries would hold gold in their treasury for their currency reserves, essentially. This was replaced by the U.S. Treasury bill. So you would take your extra dollars and you would just buy treasury bills, which is U.S. debt. That means the dollar surplus countries were financing U.S. For, uh, deficits year after year. And most significantly, in the 21st century, the Chinese take are the main uh, source of these purchases, or a huge one. And they accumulate enormous reserves because they have such a trade surplus with the U.S. And the U.S. won't let them buy uh, certain strategic assets like big oil companies or things like that. So the Chinese buy uh, treasury bills. But this is a bad deal for China because they're essentially paying for their own military encirclement. And they have started to realize this. and They've started to de-dollarize. Uh, the U.S. has used this dollar weapon uh, to try to attack other countries. But the result of that is not victory on their part, as we see with Russia. It's that they have hastened the creation of new systems that are going to replace the dollar system. And this is uh, the economic shock.
that the U.S. is headed towards, uh, which hopefully they can recognize a need to reform the system fundamentally, but that would also entail um, a, a fundamental change in politics in the U.S. as well and some reforms to the system to go from a, a very scary system of global dominance to more or less being a normal country that's dedicated to trying to uh, make the place prosperous and healthy and you know uh, improve the lives of its citizenry. Uh, this is where the U.S. should go. And these things are outcomes of economic struggles and and intrigues related to the closing of Bretton Woods. Of course, the Kennedy assassination figures into this because that's why you had the Vietnam War in the first place. And then Watergate was also related to this in a sense, because one of the things that Nixon did, which upset the establishment, was he wanted to not have an integrated you know, $1 system. He actually wanted to stick it to some of these countries like Japan and uh, West, Euro West European countries that had trade surpluses with the US, he wanted to use some protectionist measures, which would have probably forced them out of the, the US one world orbit. And that may be part of why Nixon had to go. So everything has been about really this global dominance project, uh, the being the one power in the world, that really is the thing that connects the Kennedy assassination to Watergate, to the oil shocks, uh, to uh, the Volcker shock, the debt crises, all, all of these, the, the global war on terror, the, the Arab Spring, this is really, I think, a, a key here to, to understand these events. It mostly does since Kennedy. Um, Kennedy was the last person, uh, as Jeffrey Sachs just said to Judge Napolitano, he was the last president who really tried to run as a democratic statesman. And the people since then have just been toadies, uh, mouthpieces, legmen, bagmen for an oligarchy of corporate wealth. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. Reagan was, I think, the first modern form of this. Jimmy Carter was a transitionary character. He was a transition from the older liberal politics of the Democratic Party to the new corporate one. But he wasn't really perfect in that role, which is why his main benefactor, David Rockefeller, went from basically handpicking him to be the president um, to jumping camp and being part of the side that helped to sabotage Jimmy Carter's reelection in 1980 because he had some conscience about some things. He wanted to make some reforms in the U.S. domestically to the intelligence community in foreign policy. He wanted some respect for human rights. And these things were unacceptable to the American right. And then he, of course, tries to please them in different ways, like he passes deregulation. He actually be really begins the defense buildup that we credit with Reagan uh, Carter tried to do some of these things, but even all the things that he did try to do to please the right wasn't enough. And eventually you get Reagan and every guy since then is not that different from Reagan. It's just Reagan, different versions of Reagan. Well, Jimmy Carter was a person who I think was set up to fail. He was there during a time when the economy was, was being mostly influenced by very powerful forces that seem to be out of the president's control. Even the Federal Reserve was not that easy for the president to control, but also, uh, you know, the oil price is going up so high uh, under his tenure. You had more oil shocks during that time period. Of course, you had the Volcker shock, but Volcker, as the Federal Reserve chairman, he raises rates and that causes some short-term economic shocks for the U.S. He was foisted on Carter by David Rockefeller. So it wasn't that Carter had the instincts to do this himself. And in fact, uh, that, that goes also for the um, hostage crisis. Uh, just as it was David Rockefeller who selected Carter and put him into office, more or less the Trilateral Commission, he and Zbigniew Brzezinski said, why don't we make Carter our man? And that's how it ended up happening. Um, <clears throat> but Rockefeller also recommended that he allow the, I won't say he recommended, he forcefully advocated for uh, Carter to allow the Shah of Iran to enter the U.S. for medical uh, treatment. Carter resisted this and resisted this, and eventually they create this whole lobbying campaign called Project Eagle or Project Alpha, depending on where you're looking, uh, and it involves all these people lobbying um, Carter to try to, to get the Shah into the country, uh, and Carter himself resisted this until the very end, and then finally he gives in and he says, now, what are you going to do when those Iranians take, uh, all of the, take all the people at the U.S. Embassy hostage in response? And, the, and 
that ended up being exactly what happened. The, the Iranians did take the U.S. people hostage and Carter couldn't do anything about it. But it just shows how much the president is beholden to powerful forces, that he really doesn't have much autonomy uh, in, in, under our system. And there's too many presidents in a row that seem to have been so feckless compared to these uh, other forces that we can't blame it on the individuals. It's something systemic now uh, that has been more or less institutionalized, that our presidents are just figureheads uh, for the system at this point. Um, but that's not to say a system like an AI system or an inanimate system uh, or an abstract organizational chart. It's a, it, it's a whole, si it's a system, a, a set of institutions that have been established by uh, and for the, to, for the benefit of very powerful and wealthy people, the richest, most powerful class of oligarchs in human history. Uh, we always, we talk about the Russian oligarchs, but they are uh, just really small time in comparison to uh the the oligarchs of the of the u.s ronald reagan was the american right-wing revolution the reaction to the new deal and so on is personified and to just internationalism of any kind of progressive form at all reagan more or less embodied that he was not a, a deep thinker, uh, nor was he a total idiot, but he had a kind of magical thinking about many things. They liked to show him movies instead of giving him briefings because he couldn't pay attention to people telling him things verbally and he couldn't read. Uh, it's too difficult to. So they would make videos and movies for him to watch and he really liked those. Sometimes he would forget what was a movie and what was not a movie. Like he talked about liberating Auschwitz as I recall, uh, but he had, of course, he had never been in the war at all. Um, I mean, he did some things back in the U.S. for the military, but he wasn't in Europe fighting. Um, so he he just would sometimes say very bizarre, strange things. I think by the end, he was suffering from pretty serious dementia or well, notable dementia, uh, not that different from Biden today. Uh, and he presided over uh, the real take corporate takeover of whatever there was left of the New Deal democracy uh, that the U.S. had. Uh, I, I think that he was an enormous boon to corporate America. The wealth disparities in the U.S. exploded. Uh, he really just w began wiping out the American uh, middle class by wiping out American manufacturing. The legacy is the Rust Belt. Um, and he was so good at be the things he did symbolically, I guess. I mean, the whole, the whole media production was effective enough combined with the relative uh, prosperity compared to the 70s, you know, which were very uneven and tumultuous, uh, that people still, there's a number of people that still really admire him up to the present day and think that like, oh, if only we had another Reagan. But the truth is all we've had is another Reagan and another and another and another. He is corporate America personified. That's why he was the pitch man uh, on a General Electric show. I mean, that was his job before. Uh, this is the military industrial complex literally would be doing infomercials for the military industrial complex or at least producing shows by them like one big commercial for GE. So he the, the shift to the right uh, of the U.S. is he personifies this, and this has this has been a time period in which uh, the U.S. has suffered. Uh, the U.S. is not as healthy and prosperous, and the future does not look uh, as bright as it once did for the United States, as it did you know decades ago, because of decades of misleadership by a, a, a corporate-dominated political class that has uh, systematically acted to basically undermine democracy in the U.S., in civil society, in the political system, in the media, uh, in the universities. It's been an, an attack on any sort of um, opposition to top-down corporate rule. Now, H.W. Bush is interesting in that a lot of people, and I myself thought he was a more centrally villainous character in years past, I now do think that he represents the old kind of waspy pre-neocon American establishment. So he wasn't really a right winger like Reagan. And I think that some of the things that he did that are famous for being a part of that Reagan era neocon, neoconservative switch, like, for example, when he was CIA director, he created Team B, which produced these inflated estimates of Soviet capabilities uh, in order to justify defense spending, you know, increased defense spending and so on. 
I think that he may have done those done that to try to placate the right to try to say like because he understood that the right was really in ascendance in the United States and that he could be the man because he really wanted to be the, the candidate in 1980 uh, but he wasn't going to be he was there under Reagan There's a strange assassination attempt of Reagan where the person who tried to shoot the president was John Hinckley, who was a friend of Bush's son. And the father, Hinckley, was a big oil man who had been one of Bush's biggest backers. So it's a very weird scene. And then there seems to be some sort of argument between him and Alexander Haig, who at the time over who was in charge. And Haig was a person who had a mysterious role in the Watergate affair and so on. So there's some sort of establishment civil war going on with George H.W. Bush, I believe, uh, among the American right. Let's not even say the establishment, let's say the establishment right, which is pretty much the whole thing now. But uh, it's strange to try to figure out what happened with George H.W. Bush, uh, because he does take office. He does get elected president in, 80, in 88. And he presides over the end of the Cold War, and he has a big victory, it seemed at the time, in the Gulf War, and then he still loses. Larry Wilkerson said this to me, and I suspect this may be correct, that his decision to force the Israelis to negotiate a two-state solution in Palestine and to condition aid guarantees, loan guarantees on that, that that may have actually been what did him in. Uh, the Israeli, you can find Israeli media reports um, saying that George Bush really you know, made a mistake there. Uh, by doing that. And um, so the significance of that, because I'd heard people like Larry Wilkerson and Ray McGovern say, oh yeah, George Bush didn't like those neocons. And that sort of seems to contradict the idea that, you know, back in the seventies when he let the neocons have a big say in the intelligence gathering with team B um, it, it seems to be in conflict there. So how do you explain that? Well, I, I think that he was in that time period in the seventies trying to, uh, essentially audition as the new front man for the, the, the growing American right, the new right wing consensus, as it were. Uh, but that when he was in office, he actually had a more sensible plan to try to avoid some of the uh, bad, potentially dangerous for the U.S. foreign policy uh, implications of Israel uh, continuing to deny uh, Palestinian you know, statehood. I think he was far-sighted enough to see that it wasn't good for the U.S. national interest, and he was part of that old WASPy, you know, CF Council on Foreign Relations, Wall Street oligarchy, uh, that class, and so he did think about the national interest in a more in a more rational, sober way, and he saw that this 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 sort of global dominance neoconservative project uh, was a little, was too risky, and that going for a you know maximalist is Israel position in vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians was also going to be bad for the U.S. image in the world and for the, US, the stability of U.S. hegemony, U.S. leadership. And so he stood up to some of those forces and for that may be the reason that he lost. Now, what's notable about it is that W. Bush more or less embraces all of those neoconservative forces. And that's why the response to 9-11 is so catastrophic. So in a way, George W. Bush learned the wrong lessons from his father's failure to win a second term, and he let the crazy people run things. People like Victoria Nuland, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, these are the people that George Bush said, go, have at it. You can have your own foreign policy. And it was a catastrophe for the world and for the U.S. So this kind of shows you how terrible the system is. You, if you, re you resist it, you could end up like JFK. You could end up like Richard Nixon. Uh, they could sabotage the re-election chances like H.W. Bush. Um, it's Or you could end up, dis or if you go along with them and you really uh, accommodate these forces that you have to accommodate or else you'll they'll end you politically, like George W. Bush did, then you just end up presiding over a disastrous administration and you've uh, you know disgraced yourself in the history books for a long time. Um, Bill Clinton is the one guy that I'm leaving off here and he really was more or less just a creation of, you know, Wall Street forces, high finance and such. He let people like, uh, you know, Rubin and Summers and all these guys that we've come to really loathe uh, in, in recent years uh, because of, you know, their role in passing all these this deregulation and, and advocating uh, changes to the monetary and financial system that led to financial collapse uh, and, and enormous inequality.
So uh, Clinton lets these guys come in and deregulate everything. They uh, massive media consolidation is allowed under Clinton. NAFTA, more free trade, you know, globalization. So here we have got like we see the globalists and the neocons are more or less like uh, you know two fingers on the same glove or whatever you want to say. I mean, it's the same sort of thing. It's just one's an economic side and one's a military side, but you have to have them both to work in concert. Otherwise, the system doesn't make much sense. So Bill Clinton was not as aggressive militarily, but it didn't really matter too much because he did. I mean, he had these operations in Yugoslavia, which were illegal. The, the U.S. essentially broke up Yugoslavia and incited these different nationalities to go at war to each other and then to intervene with a humanitarian, quote unquote, intervention. So this was a shift to a new kind of imperialism not justified by the Soviet Union and communism, but now it's humanitarianism. Uh, you know, and maybe there's drug cartels, so you need the Columbia plan in South America. And of course, there's terrorism with uh, the Oklahoma City bombing, and there's lots of, uh, you know, Islamist terror throughout the, the Middle East and Central Asia and Balkans, which uh, in some cases the U.S. is actually backing, like just like it backed them in Afghanistan in the 80s. So a lot is going on under the surface, uh, below the surface, under Clinton, and it sets the stage for the war on terror and George W. Bush. She is the author of uh, Unmitigated Catastrophe for the U.S. and for Ukraine. It's astounding the failure of this whole enterprise, and it seems so ill-fated to me. It always did from the beginning seem, I, I when the, the coup happened in 2014, it was clear to me what was happening right away, um, <clears throat> and that this was uh, potentially very dangerous because it's a nuclear power over there. Under Obama, at least, um, he realized that Russia had escalatory advantage in Ukraine, and so he didn't want to supply arms to Ukraine uh, after the coup to make them into like a full-on NATO power. He wouldn't go that far. He was at least more shrewd than that. But the next president, Donald Trump, did arm Ukraine in part because the Russiagate hoax, I think, pressured him to show that he was really as anti-Russian as anybody else. So Donald Trump armed Ukraine when Obama would not. And uh, so this was this was a disaster. And during that time period, you, a lot of arms flowed into Ukraine. Now, in 2021, Vladimir Putin was trying to uh, deal with this situation in the eastern part of Ukraine, where they were shelling the the Donbass republics. And uh, the, he he finally, at the end of the year, sends uh, a dip, some diplomatic you know feelers out, more or less stating that. There have to be these conditions uh, in Ukraine. This is a, these are red lines that are being crossed here for Russian national security. And so they're going to have to honor the Minsk Accords as they agreed, which was a peaceful plan for the eastern Ukraine. And um, they, they they would have to be neutral. They couldn't join NATO. And this was you know pretty sensible, really, if you stop to think about it. There's no way that the U.S. would tolerate on its borders what Russia, what the U.S. was demanding Russia tolerate on its own borders. I mean, this is quite obvious. This is a, such a clear double standard, <clears throat> and it's pretty rational why why Russia would see Ukraine as being, uh, you know, a big part of its national security. They can't have a foreign hostile power right there. Uh, and this, the U.S. knew this. There's a, a great WikiLeaks memo from um, the director of the the current director of the CIA <clears throat> talking, uh, and the title of it is. Niet means niet, and it says essentially that every person that they talk that they talk to over there is uh, believes that Ukraine is this the reddest of red lines for Russia, and that the U.S. would be very stupid to try to bring um, Ukraine into NATO. So they knew that this was a red line for Russia, and they went ahead and and went after it anyway. Um, this was a, a catastrophe, and and it gets compounded because when Russia does really invade. Uh, in early 2022, it's with a small force, I, I, as I understand it, around 40, 50,000 people, not intended to take over and occupy Ukraine, not intended to conquer Ukraine and put in a you know, puppet government or anything like that. It was really just to bring Ukraine to the negotiating table, which it did. And they don't, they had arrived at the the broad outlines of a peace negotiation. That's, I think it was actually getting more and more specific. And they had, they had, there were just some small details to work out. <clears throat> 
And then the U.S. sent an emissary, um, Boris Johnson, to essentially tell the Ukrainians, don't negotiate, we'll, we'll fight, you will win, we'll back you. We got your back to the end. Uh, this was a catastrophic decision. Uh, Russia didn't want war. The Ukrainians didn't want war. They were going to find a way not to go to war in a more serious way here. And the U.S. said no. Uh, and the result was a, a total disaster for the Ukrainian people. 400,000, 500,000 dead. I mean, they can't find young men anymore, as I understand it. Like the average age in the military is like 40, in the 40s now uh, in Ukraine. And it seems that the U.S. goal is just to try to keep them from collapsing before the election. So this is madness. I mean, you're talking about sacrificing even more people and even more Ukrainian land. Uh, there is under uh, no me no possible measure could you say uh, this has uh, been good for Ukraine and that we've helped Ukraine, that we've been a friend to Ukraine. It's uh, one of the more absurd things. And I, I think it's the kind of uh, just insanity uh, that prevails at the end of empires where they, their objectives that they have to try to achieve are insane and unattainable. And yet the idea of not trying to pursue them is, is not even uh, considered. So you have stooped more and more stupid policies, uh, doomed wars. You have the U S we're occupying part of Syria, but are actually fairly vulnerable there. And it, it, this, in, in, in addition to it being totally illegal, you know, stealing oil, occupying Syria land after invading it illegally. It's a very dubious uh, excuse that we're there to fight ISIS, but Syria doesn't want for the U.S. there. And most of Syria suspects that the U.S. is really behind ISIS uh, and that it's more of a sock puppet of the U.S. And that's that's the common perception in places like Iraq and Syria. Uh, probably not for no reason, I would guess. So Victoria Newland, as just one person who has single-mindedly pursued these policies, in a way, she's not remarkable herself. It's not that she possesses any talent that people would comment on many years from now, but she is the personification of this imperialist establishment that's just bent on world domination and uh, deploys people in different parts of the world to pursue these goals. The difference is that now the U.S. is not really powerful enough to do what its grand strategy of global dominance and primacy for forever uh, what that they cannot do, what that entails, and so we're left with these bizarre spectacles, like we see in Ukraine, and just more and more people just being led to the slaughter for, uh, in a war that can't be won, and these figures like Victoria Newland, who should have, you know, been fired or prosecuted for Ill illegal activities like the over the overthrow of Ukraine, which involves, you know, snipers shooting protesters uh, in order to create the chaos necessary to. Uh, finally get the president removed that the U.S. wanted removed. In early February of 2014, as the Maiden crisis was getting more violent, there was a phone call that was intercepted. It was a call between the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, Victoria Nuland, and the U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt. Questions of credibility are being raised after a private chat between two top U.S. diplomats was leaked online. I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yats and you, it's just not going to work. Yeah, no, it, I, think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay. Good. Well, do you want us to try to set up a call with him? Here's the next step. Sullivan's come back to me, uh, VFR, saying you need Biden. And I said, probably tomorrow for an attaboy and to get the deets to stick. So okay. Biden's willing. So you had this remarkable phone call where you have these two senior officials of the U.S. government apparently talking about a coup or how they were planning to restructure the government of Ukraine. Fuck the EU. No, exactly. I'm not saying the whole U.S. government feels that way. The there's, there is division on this, but the neoconservative element wants very much to change the strategic dynamic in Eastern Europe. So, um, you know, she joins the other list of notorious American uh, officials who have committed crimes uh, around the world in service of a global empire that considers itself to be above the law. Well, 9 11 is a very controversial subject in the United States. Uh, a lot of the rest of the world <clears throat> and much of the United States has suspicions that 
it was used to advance goals, uh, foreign policy goals of the U.S. <clears throat> it was, certainly was capitalized on at the very least to do so. And I think that to understand it, you really do have to understand the way that the intelligence agencies of the United States in, in cooperation with uh, those of other countries and with organized crime entities and other groups uh, have been able to run uh, use terrorism, I think, as a tool to forge international order. Uh, because in the years after um, the Cold War ended, and even really going back to the 70s, it kind of began that, that terrorism became sort of one of the main things they talked about. You had this big terrorism conference in 1973, which is an interesting year. It's the same year that the oil crisis begins, right? The 1973 war. And uh, so you start to get this systematic study of terrorism in the U.S., which is a strange thing to begin because it's like they somehow knew that this was going to be the new thing. And that ends up, once the Cold War ends, it, it replaces the Cold War eventually as the main boogeyman that justifies, you know, the whole uh, massive U.S. military juggernaut and all these bases around the world and so on. So for those reasons, people have looked at 9-11 uh, suspiciously, and it's it, people have tried to suggest, some people out really kind of out there have suggested, oh, the planes were actually holograms and there's no such thing as Al-Qaeda. It's It was all just uh, the, the U.S. flew these planes into these buildings. And uh, I, I think that this is a strange way to think about it. They can use intelligence agencies and other countries' intelligence agencies to allow for these groups to be financed, knowing that they have a certain ideological and political mission that dovetails with what the U.S. wants, you know, in a strange way. So it's not that the U.S. wants there to be a caliphate of anti-American Islamists installed in the Middle East and running the Middle East. So why would they potentially be backing these people. I mean, they did work with them throughout the 90s. This is what people need to understand. They didn't just support the Mujahideen in the 1980s in Afghanistan. They used them in places like Azerbaijan, uh, Kosovo, Chechnya. Uh, they tried to assassinate Gaddafi in the 90s using Al-Qaeda. Uh, they used them basically as little shock troops uh, at the end of the after the Cold War in places where there was still some Soviet influence. And if you have these Islamists and these Islamist terrorists, then you have an excuse to intervene militarily uh, in different ways. Sometimes they act you know, like in Kosovo, they fought on the same side as the U.S. In Chechnya, the U.S. was backing them to try to weaken Russia, even as it was uh, supposedly bailing out Russia with the IMF and helping, help, quote unquote, helping Yeltsin, but it really wasn't helping in any way. Uh, so the, the, the U.S. has played a strange double game with these uh, Islamist terrorists. And 9-11 seems like the most obvious case of a spectacular terror event being used to advance um, pre-existing foreign policy goals, which had been articulated in policy papers like the Project for New American Centuries report, Rebuilding America's Defenses, that was written in 2000. And in that report, it says like this whole transition to a, a new kind of par paradigm of global dominance uh, this is going to be a, a difficult and long transition to make uh, in the absence of some sort of catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. OK, I'm half paraphrasing there, but some of that is the language that they use. And they did say like a catalyzing event, you know, or, or a catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. So they were they were pining for some sort of spectacular uh, pretext to allow them to go on these military adventures. And then 9-11 happens. And it is exploited to the hilt by Bush, the Bush administration, and the neoconservative warmongers that he had basically staffed his administration with. Yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. So this is an event which still is quite mysterious, never been fully investigated. Uh, there's a lot of things that have traced back and that have come out in news stories that have traced back to the Saudis. Uh, and other people that, you know, Pakistani, ISI seems to be involved in this as well. And these were always, these were the same kind of groups that the U.S. Use, used as its cutouts, uh, like during the Afghan Mujahideen War in the 1980s. So the, there's a long history of the U.S. using foreign intelligence services to do its dirty work to make it less likely that they'll be caught doing anything bad. Uh, and 9-11 seems to have elements of that in it. And uh, I think that we, uh, if the U.S. ever were to have a reformist administration that was really dedicated to 
uh, grappling historically with our, our, the crimes uh, that the U.S. committed in pursuit of global dominance, then 9-11 would be one of those cases to look at and to really open up the books on and the archives, uh, which would be possible if and when the U.S. gives up the ghost of trying to rule the world forever. Because I do think that that could be a, a transformative moment politically. And 9-11 is a big uh, part of that story, at least the 21st century version. It kind of kicks off the 21st century uh, as a, really giving the U.S., a, a pretext to go on this crusade to really establish full spectrum dominance and a new American century. That's what the neoconservatives were calling for. And 9-11 was exploited for that reason. And for those and other reasons, it's a very mysterious, suspicious, a uh, very important event in U.S. history. Continuity of government is a, a very generic sounding uh, term, which is kind of what the national security state does oftentimes. Some of the worst uh, agencies were given very banal names like the Office of Policy Coordination or the Directorate of Plans or the uh, Office of Special Plans under Bush. Uh, continuity of government is another one of those. It's all, it sometimes referred to, Peter Dell Scott, I think, has done the best work on this. And uh, I wrote about it in my own, uh, in American Exception as well. And the, the other name that it was given was the Doomsday Project, or sometimes called the Doomsday Network. And these were um, bureaucratic structures and procedures put in place for uh, initially so that if the U.S. were uh, decapitated, if there was a decapitated strike, decapitation strike that removed the president and the vice president uh, from the, the command, the chain of command, there would still be a way to have a, a, a governance under those circumstances, this is especially for a nuclear attack. But these plans are all made in the utmost secrecy, and they come to include, we don't really know what. We don't know how those things have been altered over the years because it's so top secret that we don't really understand what's going on. They, were, they did planning all throughout the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, in the 90s, they were supposed to have sort of mothballed the project because there wasn't a fear of a Soviet strike anymore. But they, they didn't really. And in fact, you had people like Rumsfeld and Cheney who weren't in the government uh, working in the Pentagon uh, under the Clinton administration, um, what, formulating more COG plans for what to do in the case of an emergency. And the target of these or the potential cause of these emergencies were expanded to include domestic unrest and terrorism and, and so on, especially terrorism, I think, loomed large. So on the day that 9-11 happens, there were secret um, protocols put in place and communications over secure lines that we still don't know what were discussed, probably orders of great importance, especially a Cheney order given that day, which dealt with uh, issues of shooting down other planes and so on. So we, it would, uh, some of the mysteries of 9-11 may be explained by uh, continuity of government files and, and practices put in place. Now, one problem with this, or one, one of many, is that, number one, this is a way to override the Constitution. But uh, this is also something, uh, it creates a set of emergency practices and procedures and prerogative powers given to the national security state that we're not even really allowed to know what they are. So on 9-11, there was a, sta a state of emergency was enacted. And my understanding is that every year, the president just has renewed this. And Congress is, is by law supposed to review the state of emergency and so on, but they never do. Um, and one congressman, I think it was Jerry Nadler or Nadler, um, was, or, or Peter DeFazio, one of those two, um, he had asked, uh, he had been pressured by his constituents to ask the government about this and was told that as a congressman, he could not know the provisions of the emergency because of uh, that was one of the provisions of the emergency measures that, that uh, no people except for those with high level security clearances could even know what the procedures are. So we actually live under uh, a regime which has enacted a set of uh, emergency um, uh, prerogatives uh, that override the Constitution, and we're not even allowed to know what those are. So we don't know what we're not allowed to know. We don't know what powers the government has assumed. Uh, we can't say. So 
I mean, you could imagine all sorts of things that could be related to this. One random one, the Michael Hastings' death. He crashed in a car, but some people think he was murdered. Could that have been continuity of government because he was going to report on something that was deemed so sensitive that it could be damaging to national security? I mean, it's quite possible because the logic of all of these kind of emergency, doomsday, uh, you know, life or death bureaucratic things is so dire that you can rationalize almost anything if you're thinking that way. If you're thinking that no existential threats must be neutralized, that then it raises the question, well, who gets to decide what is a threat and what isn't? Who decides what is really the threat to national security that gets to uh, serve as a pretext for these extraordinary powers? And it turns out that there are people that do get to decide those things, and we don't really even know who those people are. Uh, this is something to think about for anybody who's concerned about having a, a open lawful government it's quite possible that the day of the kennedy assassination the, the continuity of government networks were involved in that this is more or less hinted at in a film that was made during the time that kennedy was alive and that was actually made as a warning about treasonous generals and national security officials it's called seven days in may and that film, it's about a president who's going to negotiate with the Soviet Union. And so the generals are plotting a coup. And Kennedy had it made into a movie to warn the public about these right-wing generals and how potentially treasonous they were. He even allowed for it to be filmed at the White House. He was out of town that day to let them film out in front of uh, the White House. He went up to New England, I think. And during a part of the movie, they're at this place that they call it Mount Thunder, but it's clearly a reference to Mount Weather, which is a top secret, basically COG military facility. Uh, and that was included in the movie. And one of the people, Jack Crichton, who was in the motorcade, he's a guy connected to oil, a guy connected to military intelligence and to continuity of government planning. He was there in Dallas that day and he was in the motorcade. And he also was involved in helping to manipulate uh, Marina Oswald and sort of orchestrate her strange testimony and her being coached to give all this testimony. So it's quite possible that the Kennedy assassination itself was a doomsday project, like a, it, that it actually had some government auspices uh, that, it, that it was under supervision of some sort of doomsday emergency provision that some group of people had decided uh, that Kennedy was actually a threat to national security. He was sec he was secretly using back channel communications to to speak with Castro and Khrushchev. By the logic of these military men, that would be grounds for uh, that would be high treason in their in their mind. Like that could we could they could say they could justify doing whatever uh, because that's what happens if you create these systems. Number one, they're secret and uh, they are above the law, so they can. They could do much of whatever they want uh, and then assert national security prerogative to uh, have other agencies and even the national media go along with whatever they say because it's national security. Uh, this is, there's a lot wrapped up in this kind of uh, uh, bureaucratic organization. If you're, it's, it's essentially a way to have the, the power, the, uh, the state power of a fascist system of government, but while in a, 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 it's disguised, it's a covert democracy, but really uh, when it needs to, the state can intervene and kill with impunity as though it were a fascist state. Uh, the difference is that it can't say that it's doing it. It has to have cover stories and it has to corrupt the, the legal system and the media and academia and so on to make sure that it can continue to run things this way. Uh, but of course, the downside to this is that you may deal with certain democratic pressures to you know reform politics through you know cloak and dagger techniques and so on but those pressures to improve politics and improve society are still going to to be there in the US and around the world and if you do these heavy-handed things you will generate opposition to your uh, to your regime that's what's happened to the U.S. So continuity of government is an obscure but important part of the story of how the U.S. became a kind of global despot uh, and one that was in, that routinely violated the law in a heavy-handed way, you know, because we can we do it because we can. The strong do what they will. The weak suffer what they must. That seems to be the logic at play here. Uh, and it's not it, it, they've been catastrophically successful. They've created they've done so many things in this way.
that they've created a global opposition to the U.S. and the U.S. is increasingly isolated uh, and, and the rest of the world and increasingly only able to just, just speak the language of pure power uh, right at the time that it's that it's power vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world is actually uh, lower than it's ever been. So uh, I, I, continuity of government is a part of this story. It's a part of the bigger story of kind of a, a covert dictatorship that has uh, more or less presided since the end of World War II, especially after the death of JFK, and even more so with the uh, ascension of Ronald Reagan and the so-called Reagan Revolution. And now the, the unipolar moment uh, has come and gone, basically, and we're just in denial about the fact that it has gone. Well, I can't say that I have a perfect theory of what happened on that day, but it, I suspect that it was something of a what you could call a structural deep event or an economic deep event. This is what Peter Dell Scott writes about, and he deep events would include things like Watergate, the JFK assassination, Iran Contra, the 1980 October surprise. You know, events that come from the uh, clandestine parts of our of our system, and what happens in 2008. Um, the the way that it unfolded, the way that it's actually so predictable when you look at it, how they deregulated certain things and, and they let these ratings agencies get away with fraud. They let these financial institutions create absurd financial instruments. It's quite predictable that it would have ended in disaster. And some people did predict it perfectly in major magazines like Michael Hudson, uh, his explanation of it in, in the, on the cover of Harper's. Uh, the coming mortgage collapse or whatever. I mean, I think he wrote that in like, oh, five, oh, six or something, but it was right on. It was right on. And uh, so you have to think like, well, are they all really ignorant or was this done, you know, as a some sort of scheme in some way, potentially to just shift wealth upwards? I mean, that was really the impact is that it really wiped out the wealth of a, a lot of the bottom 60 percent of the U.S. population, especially hitting uh, black people, Latino people, uh, very hard. And that is, um, that, that is quite serious. It's, uh, it also happened at the perfect time for the administration or, or the changeover in administrations where the Washington was really paralyzed. The political leadership was paralyzed to do anything about it. Uh, you know, Bush vacillated and the, it was corrupt as could be. And with the, the, the brother of the treasury secretary, had, had himself made a billion dollar bet that he won based on the derivatives uh, that were, you know, gonna, going to collapse during this time period. Uh, he made his own bet and cleaned up on this. I mean, it was one of the most absurdly corrupt uh, things on its on the surface. And uh, it really was a way to exploit the fact that the U.S. had control of this dollar system. So China, which had been accumulating dollars as its reserves, as though the dollar were this, you know, money exchange that we think of where it has some connection to real world value. But all of these keyboard wizards with their derivative madness had created vast fortunes of these same dollars that China had to work so hard for. Uh, and then all of a sudden the U.S. is saying, well, to solve this, we're just going to have to print a bazillion dollars here and there and, and uh, you know, flood the rest of the market with liquidity and so on. Uh, we'll have to tax uh, the the U.S. past TARP or whatever, but you know they they pay most of that back. But that doesn't really account for the uh, the the money from like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and so on, and the the money that the the Fed created, which we still can't really get a hold of. Uh, I've heard Michael Hudson say something like thirteen trillion dollars was created to deal with this, but you really just have to look at the aftermath of it to get a bigger sense of it. Because when you start talking about all this money and you know it's all on computer keyboards and so on. It's, it's very abstract, and it's, it's not something that we should take of as being the most real thing in the world. It is a kind of fictitious and crazy thing. It's as crazy as it seems, a bunch of numbers on a keyboard floating around in space, and then credit that gets created out of thin air, destroyed through scandal, scandalous, you know, bad policies, but then you just create a, a whole lot more money out of thin air because you have that power. It, it, is, as, it is as absurd as it seems to the layperson, I think, uh, to the casual observer, um, but if you take a step back and think, well, after it's not like this money was like uh, it, it's not like the money was in tacos and we don't have any more tacos. It's like this, the housing, the productive capabilities of the economy, the factories, everything else, 
the farmland, it's all still there. It's just the representation of it, the abstract representation of this wealth in the world and money was essentially rearranged in such a way that when the dust cleared, the lower 60% was much poorer and worse off and lost their houses oftentimes. And the wealthy were just fine or better because they actually profited off of it. It was a bloody out there and they got to buy things at fire sale prices. So they really benefited from it. Uh, so I, I suspected it was some kind of structural uh, economic deep event and then times to happen during the changeover administrations. Obama comes in. He's supposed to save the homeowners, which he could have done for a tiny fraction of the cost. He could have bought off all those mortgages and then all those people would have had, they could have either owned their homes outright or had a much reduced mortgage if they wanted. And that would have been much cheaper than what he actually did. But he made the bankers whole. It's a, it's a tremendous scandal what Obama did, kicking all these people out of their homes when they didn't have to be. It wasn't good for the economy to do that. It didn't help the financial system to do that. Uh, it, it just allowed a heist uh, of all time really to take place uh, by the bankers. He basically secured their getaway and, uh, and that was that. But when you look at Obama, you the WikiLeaks, uh, one of their disclosures revealed that Obama's cabinet was essentially picked by a Citibank guy, or there was an email from a Citibank executive saying, here's who we think your cabinet should be. And he gets them almost all correct. Like there was only like one or two that he, that they, that he missed. So this is who, what Obama was. It's an extension of Clinton. It's that Wall Street, you know, neoliberal, uh, global, pro-neoliberal globalization people, pro-high finance, part of the oligarchy. Uh, that was what Obama represented. And so the financial collapse was, uh, was a heist. Uh, it was the heist of the, heist of the century, uh, uh, probably. Either that or the U.S. stealing all the gold from West Papua uh, in Indonesia it ranks up there, but uh, I think that if the world survives the, the evaporation of U.S. global dominance, we will look at uh, the, that period of U.S. primacy after World War II as uh, kind of a criminal enterprise uh, in, in many ways with, you know, hitmen and the theft of resources and financial crimes and so on. Uh, I think it would be quite amazing if there is really a true um, truth and reconciliation uh, effort in the United States in the wake of this of the of what I think is coming in, in before too awful long uh, the coming collapse of the U.S. U.S. empire and a transition to a different um, U.S. orientation towards the rest of the world.